Today's video idea is to show that it's true, that life in Palestine is hard because of the wall. It's hard because of the siege. It's hard because there is no internet on your phone. Although being hard, the idea from the video is to show how Palestine was able to be a normal country, and life is normal most of the time despite these hardships. And that is my message for today. From Israel and Palestine to Syria, Afghanistan and Iraq, social media has redefined how we at home experience the world's worst conflicts. Writer David Patrikarakos noticed the change when covering the conflict in Ukraine, particularly how information on Twitter sprints past the reporting from traditional news outlets such as the BBC or CNN. When writing about the prominence of where we get our news, he extols individuals over institutions. Well, let's talk to the man himself, David Patrikarakos, who's written the book, War in 140 Characters, How Social Media is Reshaping Conflict in the 21st Century. David, good to have you on the program. Before we talk about the details of your book, are you a little bit annoyed that you can now tweet in 280 characters? <laughs> well, uh, that change occurred the very week my book <laughs> came out. So I was quite perturbed by that, but uh, it doesn't make any difference to the content. <laughs> right. And as I always say, buy a copy, make sure there'll be a second edition called War in 280 <laughs> Characters. Yeah, my commiserations to you and your publisher. Now, tell me how social media Thank has transformed conflict in a nutshell. Look, uh, it has essentially given a voice to those who were once voiceless and it has, it has made asymmetric wars no longer so asymmetrical. And the key to all this as well is the changing nature of warfare. So it has come at a time when warfare, the nature of warfare is changing. This convergence of factors have made it such that social media is now affecting war drastically. Mm -hmm. And so over the past few years, we've had this almost utopian view of social media. We go, great, people on the ground who are under the bombs can tweet about it and can tell you what's happening and governments who are covering things up can't cover it up anymore because this person has Twitter or this person has Facebook or, or they can live stream, right? But then we saw, especially with the Arab Spring and, and onwards, we saw that power smuggles itself into the system and governments and militaries and so on and so forth start to use social media themselves. So who's winning this battle? You're absolutely right. I mean, the author Yevgeny Morozov has a term for the initial belief. He calls it cyber utopianism. The belief that give a man or woman access to the internet and it will set them free. Mm -hmm. Now, for a while and to a degree, it may. Uh, we look at the Arab Spring, for example. The, you know, the initial uprising certainly never would have been possible without social media. However, in the end, as you absolutely correctly say, the tools used by the oppressed will eventually become uh, used by the oppressor. And if you're of Russia, for example, and use them in a very smart way, then they will be very, very effective indeed. Tell me how the Russians are doing it well. Look, um, the first thing, if, you, if you're a, an oppressive state, you know, the first mistake you will make is to censor or ban the internet. This is the mistake that uh, China makes, that Iran makes, and to an extreme degree, North Korea makes. Now, a country like Russia, which is in all, to all intents and purposes a dictatorship, doesn't want to look like one. What it does is it doesn't ban Facebook, it doesn't ban, that ban Twitter or Vcontacta, its version of Facebook. What it does is it gets on those platforms itself and uses those very platforms to promulgate its propaganda, to promulgate its narratives, to promulgate its fake news. Now, the interesting thing with Russian propaganda is unlike the propaganda of old, unlike the Soviet Union, which tried to present a positive view of uh, the USSR, of communism, as the ideal society, of the USSR as the utopian ideal. Russian propaganda is not concerned with presenting a positive image of Russia. Now, I'm sure, you know, they'd like to do that, but I suspect they're savvy enough to realise it's not possible. Instead, what it is designed to do is to create and promulgate and spread so many competing falsehoods and narratives that the ability of uh, the average consumer to recognise the truth when they see it is greatly diminished. Mm -hmm. And this is at the heart of it. Right. And so if I gave you an example of, say, a pitch meeting here at work for, for my show, sometimes we're in pitch meetings 
uh, morning meetings or weekly meetings, and we have you know, qualified journalists with years of experience. A lot of the time, people give pitches based on what they came across on their Twitter feeds or what they came across on their Facebook feeds as stories that we might want to cover. Given that it's so noisy out there, and given that it might be so difficult to verify things, is that dangerous that journalists such as ourselves are going, hey, I saw this thing on Facebook, maybe we should cover it? Look, that's always, always a problem. Uh, the information ecosystem we live in now is extremely unhealthy, it's extremely sick. Now, you hope that uh, professional journalists, such as those you employ, are savvy enough to pick up on what's fake and what isn't. And there's certain things that uh, you do. First of all, you start with a, a knowledge of a geopolitical issue. And, you know, there are signs that things are fake. I mean, if it's one random article, as opposed to, you know, many things saying the same thing or many tweets saying the same thing. But it's absolutely a danger. Uh, less so for journalists, I would like to say, because, you know, we're, this is our work and we're in that environment constantly. But look, you only have to look at what's come out of the tech hearings in the US. They, you know, where it is said that uh, a Russian bought, you know, fake news ads and uh, fake news stories reached potentially 126 million people. Now, that's almost the number of people who voted in the US election. Now, clearly, even if it reached that number of people, it mm -hmm. certainly didn't affect the voting calculations of anywhere near that number of people. But look, all you need is 1% or of that number, right half a percent and you can really change something and if it's the election of the most powerful person in the world that is very serious indeed mm -hmm. david patrick Karakos, that was a great conversation really good to talk to you